Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be back. I told you my wife last night, and I'm just tired of sitting in the car. <laughs> if you don't know, I was down in St. Louis this week for class, and then I drove to Des Moines. We had a wedding. I appreciated the wedding last night in Perry, and she drove home last night as I finished my seminar. So. <laughs> it's been one of those weeks, right? Um, no really uh, new announcements to start uh, worship today. Um, we do have one new song, maybe a new year for that one. You guys sang before, 10,000 Reasons. To do it a lot. Yep, you guys have done it, so. Um, I request it as one of my favorite songs. <laughs> that. All right? So we did last week, and I thought there was kind of, you could stand and kind of throw a wave at people or give each other out. My handshake, I'm not, you know, COVID's still a thing, so whatever you're comfortable with, but let's give a greeting and then we'll prepare for worship, okay? Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I was a little late this morning, sorry. You're fine. <laughs> Thank you. 
Almighty God, who created us to be people and community. Make us good stewards of all the talents you give us by relinquishing our pride and accepting the talents you give others. Teach us to receive joyfully their help, that we may do your, do your work for Jesus' sake. Amen. <coughs> The Old Testament reading for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost is from Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be help, hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes, and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion. According to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints, and this not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that you, your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that is a matter of fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. 
Please rise for reading the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fifth chapter. When Jesus had crossed in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and the great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and had suffered much under many physicians, and spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they had said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear. Only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? This child is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all aside and took the father's child and mother, and those who were with him, and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said, Talitha, Puma, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was twelve years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know of this, and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. <laughs> message, 
I realize there's many things I take for granted in life. And one of those things I realize I take for granted this week is threat. Yes, threat. You see, every day of my life, there's something in it that has threat, right? My clothes have threat. Furniture in my house has thread. The upholstery in my truck. The tent that I go camping in has thread. A baseball has thread. A football has thread. These are just some of the uses for thread in our lives. Did a little research about thread. It comes in many different types and colors. Made from several different materials. It's been around for thousands of years. Thread is one of those things that has held the test of time. Thread is strong. Thread is simple. And there's nothing that can really replace thread. Thread is a simple part of our lives that we take for granted of just how well it works. Thread simply connects things together. And as I thought about that, we all take thread for granted in our lives until the thread breaks. Last February, I was refereeing a high school basketball game. During halftime, we usually go in the locker room, get something to drink, rest a little bit, use the restroom, go back out for the second half. As I was preparing to go out for the second half, I buttoned my pants and the button popped off right into my hand. No way to secure my pants for the second half. I looked around the locker room for something. Something to help secure my pants. Maybe a, maybe a safety pin. Something. Nothing to be found. I knew we had to get back out to the court. So I went out to the scorer's table. And I asked. My pants button is broken. I need something for my pants to hold them up. The lady at the scorer's table said, all I have is a paper clip. And she handed it to me. <laughs> In haste, I moved it through the hole where my button was, hooked it to my belt loop, and the second half was about to start. Now, usually as a referee, you pay attention to the game, right? That's my job. But I'll tell you that I was more concerned about whether my pants were going to fall down than what was going on during the game. And it wasn't just any game. It was late in the season. Both teams were in the playoffs. They were pressing. They were running. And the only thing I could think about for the first five minutes is this paper clip is going to keep my pants up for the rest of the game. I'm happy to say I finished the game. My pants didn't fall down. The paper clip held. And as soon as I walked in the door, I went up to the closet, got the needle and thread out, handed my pants to my wife and said, please fix my pants. <laughs> you see, it should have been no surprise to me, though, that that butt popped off. Because I had noticed a week earlier that it was getting loose. And every game was getting just a little bit worse and a little bit worse. That button was just hanging on by a thread. But yet I took for granted that it was old. See, I'm sure we can relate to a time where we had a moment where we took something for granted, like the strength of a single thread. In our gospel reading today, we visit the story of Jairus and his dying daughter. And the woman with a bleeding problem. In each case, Jairus' daughter and the woman are holding on just by a thread. In the Gospel of Mark, we read, two, uh, <clears throat> we read of two different people who had this encounter with Jesus in his early ministry. In each encounter with Jesus, the person has a significant life of it. Jairus is the ruler of the synagogue and has a daughter that's very sick and very close to death. The other person is an unnamed woman who has a serious health problem that has made her unclean for 12 years. Both Jairus and the woman seek out Jesus for help in a personally desperate situation. One is immediate, and the other has been ongoing for a long time. Jairus' daughter and the woman were hanging on by a thread. I know we can relate to Jairus and the woman if we put, their, put ourselves in their shoes. We would try just about anything to save our daughter or to heal a long-term illness that has made us an outcast in our community. See, as I read through the scripture prepared for this, one of my first thoughts is, why are these stories together? Why are these stories together? Yes, they happen at the same time, 
But what is the thread that ties these two stories together? See, Jairus and the woman, they're from completely different walks of life. Jairus, they said, is the ruler of the synagogue and probably a very important and influential person in the community. Meanwhile, the woman is deemed unclean because of her bleeding issues that has made her an outcast in the community. Jairus, we read, immediately gets the attention of Jesus, and Jesus goes with him to see the sick child. The woman doesn't talk to Jesus, but she seeks just to touch his garments as he's walking by. Two completely different people from two completely different walks of life, and yet Jairus and the woman had a few similarities between them. The woman had a bleeding problem we read for 12 years, and the girl is 12 years old. The woman we read and Jairus' daughter are both facing health issues. Jairus and the woman both seek out Jesus when they hear that he is in town. But the most striking similarity for me between Jairus' daughter and the woman is that they are just hanging on by a thread. Jairus' daughter's life is literally hanging on by a thread. We find out she most likely died just before Jesus healed her. And the woman, the woman through 12 years of illness with no answers is hanging on by a thread. I can imagine she's just tired. She's just tired of dealing with the illness and trying to seek treatments. See, we've all had times in our life where we felt like we are just hanging on by a thread. Some of us have received a phone call where there was a serious accident. And we just don't know if our loved one will make it through the injuries. Some of us have received a diagnosis for an illness that we've yet to find a treatment. Day after day, we struggle physically and mentally with the illness. We try to hold on to our faith in Jesus, and some days it's just hard. It's just hard to focus on God and not on our personal issues going on in our lives. We pray to God to take away the illness and cure us or save our loved ones. And yet it feels like God isn't listening. Doesn't God understand that I'm hanging on by a thread and I don't know how much more I can take? See, I've been in some very similar situations. And my words to you are this. Don't give up faith. Don't give up faith. Hang on to the thread. Because through faith, you are connected to Jesus Christ. Through faith, when Peter and John found the threads of the burial garment without a body in them, we were guaranteed that Jesus defeated death. He defeated death and sin and paid the price for our sin so that we may spend eternity in heaven with our Savior. The common thread for Jairus and the woman, and for you and for me, is the thread of faith that connects us to Jesus Christ. Do you notice the similar responses Jesus gave to Jairus and to the woman? To the woman, Jesus said, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And to Jairus, Jesus said, Do not fear. Only believe. Faith. Believe. Yes, Jesus healed Jairus' daughter and the woman, but Jairus and the woman both had faith. So we'll make that clear. They both had faith. Through faith, when we are hanging on by a thread, Jesus covers us with his robe of righteousness, and we are free from sin and guilt and shame. Yet we know that through Jesus, our faith in Jesus does not guarantee that God will answer all of our prayers. He will not heal all of our illnesses, and he's not going to save us from all our accidents. You see, we live in a broken world. And ever since Adam and Eve started sewing leaves together to cover themselves, illness and accidents and sin and shame have been a part of our world. I wanted nothing more than my mother to be healed of her illness. I don't remember a day as a kid that she was sick. She struggled most days 
and was in the hospital on more, more than one occasion because of her health problems. I remember going to the church of my grandparents and we lit a candle and prayed for my mom. By the 44 years of age, she died because of her illness. You see, we are connected in faith with Jesus. Not because he will answer my prayer or heal my ailment. We do pray that he will heal us, though, because we know he can. We read it. We just read it. Jairus' daughter and woman. But when we feel our prayers are not heard, or our illness is not cured, or we're hanging on by a thread, know this. That thread is connected to the promise of the resurrection for each of us. In that resurrection, we're going to be given a new body. The same that Jesus did on Easter Sunday. You see, I know that my mom will have a new body in eternity. I will have a new body in eternity. And each of you will have a new body in eternity. That is the thread that I hang on to as a Christian. That is the thread of faith that connects us to Jesus Christ. See, we hold on to our faith sometimes by a thread. A thread that is no different than the bleeding woman who just wanted to touch Jesus' garment. Jairus, when faced, when, when his daughter felt like, Jairus, when his daughter died, felt like he was holding on by just a thread. We too, when faced with adversity, hold on to our faith by just a thread. But that single thread is all we need to still be connected to Jesus. Back in August 2016, I was literally in the middle of a high-speed chase, just a few blocks from my house. A normal, everyday Monday night. As I was driving a speeding SUV, driving the wrong direction in my lane, barely missed hitting the front of my car. I remember following that car in my rearview mirror and watching the lady beside me just behind me get hit head on in one of the most violent cases I have ever seen in my life. My immediate thoughts were this. There's no way she could survive that, that collision. And if she did, the life would be hanging on her just a thread. I remember getting out of the car, trying to call 911 because my hands were shaking. And I prayed that as God will, she would survive. I watched the EMTs and the firemen get the lady out of the car and put her in the ambulance. As I was being questioned by the FBI because I was a witness to this accident. You see the guy that was driving that SUV it was stolen. And he escaped from prison in Kansas. I missed by a thread being a victim of this car accident. But I had to connect with this lady who was hit head on. Through Facebook, I was able to connect with the lady's sister and get some information about her. I found out her name is Amber. She's in pretty bad shape, but she was alive. She had multiple fractures, too many to count, including her neck. She spent 28 days in a coma, five emergency surgeries. I'm still in contact with Amber, and we're still Facebook friends. In 2016, I remember this post from her. This is just four months after the accident. I'm not sure why God spared my life that day, but I'm forever grateful. I'm trying to be as positive as I can. But it's hard some days. It's hard some days. Today is one of those days. I know in trying times we can all relate to Amber's Facebook post. When we're not at peace with our circumstances or events in our lives. And we feel like we're hanging on by a thread. See, Amber was just on her way after work. To pick up her son from her parents' house. And her life changed just like that. I remember it was Christmas, just a few months after the accident. She's in a real rehabilitation center. I went to visit her for the first time. She said when she was in a coma, she died five times. I remember she had five emergency surgeries. She said each time she could feel herself getting short of breath, her dad and one of her family members started praying. And she said she heard a choir singing. And I felt myself starting to breathe again, and everything was okay. 
She said she literally saw her life hanging on by a thread five different times. I wish I could tell you Amber's back to work, happy and healthy after the accident. She's not. From the accident, she lost her job. She now suffers from PTSD and depression. She has many ongoing mental and physical issues. I just read she has to go back in for additional surgery to correct damage done to her intestines by the seatbelt. And she also has type 2 diabetes. She struggles most days and wonders why me. You see, Amber has the same faith that the woman in Jerry's had. But yet she has not seen her health issues from the accident be cured or taken away from her. The woman, Jarius, Amber, my mother, me, each one of us are connected through faith in Jesus because of the resurrection and the promise of our resurrection. And that is what we hold on to in faith. I wish I could show you a picture of this. I, I did post it on Facebook this morning. So if you're Facebook friends with me, you can see this picture. But I'll try to describe it. When we were in Israel a few years ago, we visited Magdala. Magdala is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, near Capernaum. Magdala is a first century fishing village, the home of Mary Magdala. In Magdala, we visited the Encounter Chapel. And behind the altar of the Encounter Chapel was this huge painting. The painting was probably 30, 40 feet wide, 10 to 15 feet tall. It spanned from one wall to the other, from just above the floor to the ceiling. And the painting was an up-close depiction of the woman with the bleeding problem, reaching through the legs of the people near Jesus and touching the cloak of his garment. All you see is feet and sandals of people around Jesus, the bottom of their cloaks and the arm of the woman, reaching out and touching the garment. No faces, no architecture in the painting. Nothing to take away from the focus who said, from the woman who said, if I touch his garment, I will be made well. You see the woman whose faith is holding on by a thread? She's literally hanging on to the thread of Jesus' cloak. She is connected to Jesus through her faith, no matter how small or weak the thread. As I stood there and looked at that painting, I could see myself in that painting. When I'm hanging on by a thread, when things come up in my life, but more importantly, it reminds me that I'm connected to Jesus through faith. And what did Jesus tell us? Don't fear hanging on by a thread. Jesus tells us to believe and know that we are connected to him. When it feels like you're hanging on by a thread, continue to hang on. Go to him in faith. Hang on to him in confidence. Cry out to him for help. Trusting that he already has come for you. And he will come again. Amen? Let us pray. No matter the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, our ushers will come forward and collect the offering.
let us confess our faith found to the word of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord of Jesus Christ, the only God, the Son of God, the God of his Father before all worlds, God of God, my light of light, the very God of the very God, the God of my faith, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men for our salvation, and now for heaven, and as the divine by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. And the same again, and was crucified also the cross of the divine Father, he suffered and was buried, and the very day he rose again according to the scriptures, and sits in the heaven, and sits at the right hand.
receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and gives you his peace.
She's like, are you sending a, a newsletter article? It's like, ooh, I forgot. Um, so she will probably print that tomorrow, but it will be available for next week through July. Okay, the portals of prayer is out, the July newsletter will be out next week. And we'll get an email out this week for sure. Okay? And if you haven't seen the logo, the logo is going to start appearing in the new logo we put out last week. It's in your bulletin in black and white, but it's purple. Uh, so you see it on social media, some of the friends and stuff. And so, again, I think at least that's a great idea. It's a simple discussion. It's very simple, but it tells a lot about the church. So there's, there's been, a, been a lot of good comments about it. Good change. That's for one more. Um, I know I've changed this a couple of times. The choir practice will be at 6.30. That's why I told the choir most recently, so. 6.30. There was an original email that said 6. Ignore it. That was weeks ago. It's going to be 6.30. Final answer. <laughs> <laughs> if my episode started at 6.30, I'd be at 6.30. Uh, 6.30. We're, we're staying on 6.30. We are staying on 6.30. All right. We're staying on 6.30. All right. And Nancy has one announcement today. They packed meals yesterday yeah. up in Sioux City, and so. Uh, I mean, what it's called. I know it's different. Names. Mercy Meals. Mercy Meals, thank you. Um, we went up yesterday, and I'm, I'm giving a commercial so you will think about this. Um, we had a group of six drive to Sioux City. Faith Lutheran Church in Sioux City is the host location where we pack meals, and it's really an awesome project. The dehydrated meals are aimed at child malnourished children abroad. And the packages are sent to a, recon a, a, a feeding station where a Christian organization will reconstitute them and deliver them to children in the area. So this is an awesome group, and I believe they're in their ninth year of doing this. They started in 2012, and there are basically no costs. The Sioux City Church pays for the equipment and provides a location, like the packing, the pallet jacks, that type of thing. And then they apply for grants and do fundraising for the food stuffs that go in the package. And Nadine and Stan are supervisors, and if I got any of this wrong, please speak up. So they have been committed to the project, and they're the ones that keep us straight when we're up packing. It's a fun day. You pack for an hour and a half to two hours, and that's it. So we usually stop and have lunch on the way home. And it's just a really cool project, and we've been going, and we're hoping to go again in the fall, somewhere between August and October. And we normally do that because if we take a group they want to know in advance how many of us are coming because they set up the packing stations based on the number of volunteers that you have. So we don't commit to the winter because we don't know what the weather is going to be in Sioux City in January, you know, when we need to commit a few weeks ahead. So we want to go before the weather turns and we would love to have more people go and it is not just a ladies project. When you get there, the local churches, the fraternities, the sororities, the youth groups in the area go. So this is for guys and gals. And if we get a group together and caravan up, it'll be great fun as well. So please give it some consideration and hope we'll be picking a date here within the next month or so where we can kind of plan ahead. It's always the fourth Saturday of the month. They pack once a month. Did I miss anything? Okay. Thank you. I've, I've done the same thing in Des Moines. Similar, very similar projects, just different names, different organizations. Um, and I told Nancy this morning in one of our mission trips that our church back in Des Moines packed meals the kids did on Wednesday night, um, but we also got to deliver them in the community, which was really cool to see them from beginning to end. So they really do make an impact, uh, and it's really simple. I mean, you just it's just fun. I mean, we, we've done it with family. You can visit. It's all age. Uh, the only thing is you got to stand on your feet. I mean, that's, that's about the only requirement. And they have some jobs for people who need to sit. Yeah. So they normally ask you, and if you have a preference for sitting, you might get the weighing station versus the packing station. So they try to accommodate everyone's physical needs. And you might hear the project also affiliated with the Orphan Grain Train because they're the ones who do the delivery, the Mercy Meal side. And again, I'm trying to make sure I don't misspeak, is the packing side of it. So it's an awesome, awesome project if anyone is available the next time we go. So thank you. We'll look at the football schedule and make sure it doesn't conflict with anybody. <laughs>
We know Nebraska fans have nothing to worry about. I'm not so sure about the Hawkeyes, but my team's supposed to have a really good year, so we'll see, Nancy, if I'm going to be available. And if it's a really good game that Saturday, we'll make sure we got TV up so we can watch the game with some packed meals, all right? All right, so <laughs> have a great week. Uh, I, I just see some new faces, so I look forward to meeting you. Uh, and we'll see you next week back at worship. Have a great week.